hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to part one. You are going to listen to a conversation between two people, a customer and a representative of a company which rents cars. There are three alternative answers, A, B and C, for each question. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer and circle the appropriate letter. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Thank you for calling Carline. So that we can best help you, can you please press the star button on your phone now? Thank you. Now choose one of the following four options by pressing the buttons on your telephone. Press 1 if you would like to make a car reservation. Press 2 if you would like to talk to someone about a car reservation. Press 3 if you would... Please hold while we put you through to one of our assistants. Good morning, Melanie speaking. How can I help you? My name is Mr. Maxine and I booked a car several days ago to be picked up from Heathrow Airport in London and I'd like to change the booking. I see. Have you got a reference? Yes, I have it here somewhere on a piece of paper. Uh, ah, here it is. It's A for Alpha, C for Charlie, F for Foxtrot, Y for... Yeah. Yes. The number of 15, uh, 1, 5, A for Alpha, and G for Go. Let's see. Can I just check that? A, C, F, Y, 15, A, G. Yes. Mr. John Maxine. Yes, that's it. OK, so how can I help you? I booked a car for three days from this Friday at 6pm to Monday at 6pm. Yes, a manual. I'd like to change it for a larger car and an automatic rather than a manual. And I'd also like to book it for five rather than three days. OK, let's have a look. Mm, we have an estate which is automatic... Yes, that would be perfect. There is a difference in price, though. For the extra two days? Yes, but also for the size of the car. The estate is £15 more expensive per day than the saloon car you have already booked. OK. And how much extra is it altogether, then? Um, that makes it an extra £165. Hmm. It seems rather expensive. Uh, the last time I hired one, it wasn't so much. When was that? Um, several weeks ago. I see. Before the speakers continue their conversation, look at questions 7 to 10. Well, it's basically because the rates change daily according to the cars available. The estate is the last automatic we have for hire for that period. We have a manual estate, which is cheaper, if that would help. No, it has to be an automatic. 
OK. Shall I debit your card for the extra £165? Is it possible for me to pay the extra in cash when I pick up the car at the airport? I'm afraid that isn't possible, as there are no facilities for handling cash at that time of the day. <sighs> that seems odd. It's because the money can't be banked in the evening, and for security reasons, no cash is held on the premises. OK, you can debit my card. You'll have to give the number to me again. Isn't it logged on the screen? For security reasons, it doesn't come up on the screen when we look at the booking. Any changes, and it has to be entered again. I see. It's three double four five double nine double one. Three double four five double nine double one. Double four two five. Double four two five. Double seven five zero. Double seven five zero. Okay, that has now been authorized. Shall we send the receipt to your Park Vale address? Yes, uh, number 40. Is there anything else I can help you with, Mr. Maxine? No, nothing else, thank you. Have a nice trip. Thank you. Goodbye. That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2. You are going to hear a radio programme about sport. First, look at questions 11 to 14. And now for our Mystery Personality of the Week and your chance to win one of our fabulous prizes. Last week's competition generated a huge response and the first five answers pulled out of the bag will receive a £100 worth of sports clothes vouchers. And if you didn't win last week, here's another chance. And this week's prize is even bigger. We're giving away ten prizes of £250 worth of book, music and clothes vouchers to mark the first anniversary of the show on the air. So get your pens ready to take down the address details. Just write the name of the person you think is our mystery personality and send it to Mystery Draw at the address Marcia will give you in just a second. The address will be repeated at the end of the show for those of you who didn't get it. And so it's over to Marcia, who will tell you a few tantalising details about our mystery person this week. Thanks, Mike. Well, here goes. Our mystery person this week is a very well-known footballer who plays for a famous club and has also played for his national team. He is very talented and is enormously popular, especially for the part he played in a famous footballing victory. And two clues. He hasn't got a famous wife. And he speaks French. If you think you know who it is, then pop the answer on a postcard and send it to Mystery Draw, P.O. Box 5110, London SE1 5LE. That's P.O. Box 5110. And please don't forget to write your name and address too. And now it's back to Mike. Before the broadcast continues, look at questions 15 to 20.
Thank you, Marcia. Get those postcards in and make this a bumper anniversary draw. Now, if you remember, last week on the show, we talked to the organiser of a new group set up to help young people up to the age of 20 to get involved in activities like horse riding, tennis, scuba diving, cycling or any form of sport which involves some kind of expense. John Tebbit, the organiser, rang us to say that the response to his appeal on the show was staggering. A large number of people, both young and old, have offered their services free as volunteers. The whole thing has been overwhelming. John said that they had also had numerous offers of help throughout the country to use facilities free of charge. As if that was not enough, they've received many donations, including several rather large gifts of more than £5,000. On behalf of John Tebbit, and also of those who will benefit from the generous gifts to the Trust, I would like to say thank you. This week, we're going to talk to a very unusual athlete indeed. Patrick, who is 20 years of age, has been wheelchair-bound for the past five years after a motorcycle accident left him paralysed from the waist down. This has not stopped this young man from getting out and about. He's an inspiration to all of us. Patrick has excelled in archery, beating the best in the field, so much so that he has won sponsorship from leading sports manufacturers, which has now enabled him to devote more time to perfecting his skills. So I would like to introduce you to Patrick, who is going to tell us what this sponsorship means to him. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part two. Part 3. You are going to listen to a conversation between two students talking about a lecture they have just attended. First, look at questions 21 to 24. Henry, don't you think Dr. Adams' lecture was really very good? He could talk about the telephone directory and make it interesting. All his lectures are like that, Astrid. He's just one of those people. I wish we had him as our tutor. I bet you that he is very demanding, though. Boris is in his tutorial group and agrees that he is a brilliant lecturer, but he puts them under a lot of pressure. Hmm. But... Don't you think that's good? Perhaps. But I am glad to have Dr. Adams as a lecturer. He's interesting and rather funny and puts just the right amount of pressure on people. Did you take lots of notes in the lecture? Yes, actually I did. In fact, several pages. I didn't think I had taken so many. I was that busy listening to what was being said that I didn't take many notes. Can I photocopy yours? I don't think that's such a good idea. You won't be able to read my handwriting, and sometimes I write them in English and sometimes in Arabic. Oh, let's have a look. Wow, your notes are so neat. There's not much Arabic. There is on this page. Oh, yes, there is. Dr Adams would be pleased to see this, especially given what he was talking about. Don't you keep careful notes? Mm, sometimes. It depends on the lecture. I don't think I'll forget Adams's lecture today, but some of the detail will fade. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 25 to 30.
I type up everything afterwards, so you can have a copy then, and you can fill in anything I have missed. I'm not so good on the broader concepts. I'm better when it comes to detail. Just what Adams was talking about. Well, I am definitely a detail person. I need to have everything written down before I can get the concepts clear in my head. And I am the complete opposite. I find all the detail clutters up my mind, and I get very frustrated. Which was just what he was on about. He mentioned a book he'd written. He mentioned several. The one on space and the individual. Yes, called My Space. It's on the book list. So it is. I think I'll get that out of the library or, or get my own copy. Did you get what he said about spatial awareness? I didn't really.、Oh, yes, it was fascinating. I can't be as eloquent as Adams was, but I know several people who are frighteningly intelligent, but they have difficulty reading simple directions, even when getting to places that they know very well. I find that difficult to understand. Everyone learns the way to walk to the shops and things like that. You mean just the way people learn spelling? You know, people misspell words, make mistakes in countless areas of their lives, and going in the right direction is just the same. Remember what Adam said about the number of people who cannot tell left from right, north from south, and so on. Do you know which way is north? It's、um, that way. You see. I couldn't have told you that. Really? I haven't a clue which way is which. That's why I'm always getting lost when I go out on my bike and put me in a completely new place, and I am totally lost. What about maps? I'm hopeless at reading them. But then you're brilliant at writing essays and getting all the ideas down in the right order, and I don't know where to start. Again, just what Adams was talking about. What we need to do is combine our skills. You teach me to cope with detail, and I'll teach you how to string concepts together. Okay, we can do that. Which way is the library? It's.、Uh, you're making fun of me. <laughs>、that、is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers to part three. Listening, Part Four. You are going to hear a lecture on fishing. First, look at questions thirty-one to thirty-six. Good morning again, ladies and gentlemen. And in case you've forgotten, my name is Dr. North from the Marine Habitat Research Unit at the University, and I'm going to continue from the lecture that I gave a fortnight ago on humankind's relationship with the sea from a historical point of view, and also on attitudes to different types of fishing. In today's talk, I would like to focus on the current problems in the fishing industry in Europe. And in particular, the present scarcity of marine fish. As with the last lecture, I've placed a book list, a few relevant articles, and a copy of this lecture on the department website. A statistic to begin with: since the 1970s, stocks of the most heavily fished species have fallen on average by 90 percent. And why has this happened? Well. There's a chain of events which begins with the demographic changes that have taken place in the world over the last century. During this time, the world population has grown at a phenomenal rate, 
with efficient and heavy fishing, which is technology-driven, meeting the increasing demands for food. As a consequence, many fishing stocks in the European waters, from the Atlantic to the North Sea and the Mediterranean, are now on the verge of collapse. But the problem is not restricted to European waters. It's a situation that's all too clear all around the world. Fish stocks in the Pacific Ocean, for example, are now on the verge of collapse due to a combination of overfishing and natural changes in ocean ecology. And there's another reason behind the increased demand for fish, and that is the changes in the eating patterns of different countries. Certain countries have a long tradition of fishing. For example, the southern European countries, but eating patterns have changed in countries like the United Kingdom, where fish was once considered as food for the poor rather than the rich. People have been turning to fish as a cheap and healthy alternative to meat, driving up demand and depleting stocks. Food scares like BSE and foot and mouth disease have also driven people away from eating meat. Which again is invariably replaced by fish. Before the speaker continues, look at questions thirty-seven to forty. Another important reason is that a sizable proportion of the catch from modern trawlers or fishing boats is thrown away. Nets quite often land fish that are not wanted and which are thrown back into the sea dead. Discarded nets and other traps are responsible for the deaths of many fish. Our seas, like the rest of our environment, are littered with rubbish, which also destroys lots of fish. And fish are also being changed by the chemicals dumped into the oceans, as well as by overfishing. So the size of certain species is decreasing. More then have to be fished to produce a decent catch. And the solution? Well, there has to be more than one answer to the problem. Fish farms provide a partial solution, but the quality of the fish is usually inferior to those in the wild. Reducing the amount of fish that any one trawler or fishing boat is allowed to land is the most effective, but also the most unpopular measure. Countries in Europe, like Spain, rely heavily on fishing, and are naturally against any step which restricts their catch. But if the depletion of fishing stocks continues, there will be no fish left to fish. Take the disappearance of cod. From the great banks off Newfoundland, which was once the richest cod fishing area in the Atlantic, after a dramatic fall in the cod population for some unknown reason, a ban was imposed, which it was hoped would lead to a repopulation of the cod stocks. The cod did not return, and many fishermen were put out of work. This is a scenario which we do not want to be repeated on a large scale. Now, if you look at this table on the screen, you can see. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four.
That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.